Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash Carnivore Cast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. All right. Jonathan Griffiths, the composition consultant at composition underscore consultant on Instagram is a successful carnivore bodybuilder and brilliant nutrition consultant. He has been in the nutrition industry studying carefully for nearly 15 years. He's undertaken several courses surrounding human health, including medical science and a nutrition and herbal science certification. He's been using the most up-to-date scientific literature and experience from working with hundreds of individuals with unique health situations. Jonathan also puts out tons of free and valuable information on his Instagram and YouTube channel, both under the handle Composition Consultant. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, pleasure is all mine. Um, And yeah, I think we have a lot in common and a lot to connect with, Um, but I've also heard you speak and I think you... Um, articulate a lot of concepts around nutrition really well. Um, so, h- how did you get to um, kind of where you are and and um, f- discovering the carnivore diet? So, my journey initially would, if I'm honest, I'd say it started when I was around ten or eleven years old. Not to say I was a carnivore since that age, but what it is is that I felt I was a bit overweight I felt I was a bit fat I don't know why Um, I had that idea in my head because my brother and I would watch wrestling matches like on the tv wwe that sort of thing we'd see all these like jacked up ripped people think god they look good like you know my brother and I wanted to look like them we we idolize these these sort of people and what it is is at the age of 10 or 11 years old I did a I think it was a two-week fast looking back so I, I just drank water had some lemon juice or something, and I, I weighed myself before and after, as you do. Um, I wasn't educated in nutrition at that age, obviously, but um, yeah, I didn't lose any weight, not a gram. Wow. My body weight was exactly the same. Um, so w- fast forward a few years, um, I started bodybuilding, and I believe I was around the age of 16 when my first competition hit, and I would diet on very low effective energy intakes so i'd diet perhaps on just tuna maybe one egg so that'd be a lean cut of tuna and that'd be all i'd eat and people would say you know you know it's you need to eat some fat in your diet for nice nonsense nonsense you know um and as time went on i started to include carbs into my diet because i said i heard people say you know carbs are good for energy and this that and the other and for Maybe that's why my metabolism is slowing down. Maybe that's why I can't um, expend as much energy. And I found that frustrating because I was here. I was on uh, one thousand five hundred labeled food calories, and I wasn't dropping a gram. Like my body fat set point was just there; it would not go down. And what then happened was I started to manipulate my macronutrient ratios. So. This was this came about from the idea that bodybuilders often would reduce fat and carbohydrate intake prior to a show, particularly the last maybe week or two before a show when they're really trying to just strip it all down. Because that's the issue that I had. I couldn't get diced, I could get absolutely shredded. I struggled so much. And as a young teenager, it was it was much more difficult. I think I didn't have hormones on my side, perhaps. Um, but what I found then was that my body fat would decrease dramatically but i just had to make sure that i had enough protein and just enough fat to get me through um i then fast forward a few years started a carnivore diet 
in I believe that was two two and a half years ago. I've been on and off it then, admittedly. I have been solid on it for at least four months now. Um, I did use it to successfully getting to competition shape for a bodybuilding show last year, and I found the whole experience much easier than to do it through a carbohydrate centric approach. So what it is from there is I thought, hmm, there's something to this. I'm maintaining the same muscle size. I'm maintaining lower body fat levels, and it's much easier. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense because everyone says you need carbs and this sort of, sort of thing. And, you know, and, you know, fast forward to where I am now. Um, I've been on Sean Baker's podcast. And, yeah, I've just met so many like-minded people that have had tremendous growth and development, not just physically, but mentally, like the way I process things cognitively, my ability to interact with people. It's, it's not great, admittedly. Um, I can be difficult at times, but I do now find it a lot easier to speak to people like Scott and other great YouTubers alike. That's awesome. And, um, did you find that there was an adaptation period um, with your like numbers in the gym and in your lifting when you switched to a carnivore diet? And and when did you make the switch? Was it like at the start of the contest prep or was it, you know, before you started a contest prep? Like, how did you handle that? Yeah. So what it is, is I started contest prep for my last show 18 months out from the show. I didn't start from uh of a fat um competition but what happened was due to lockdowns and things and slowing down in general around the world um they wouldn't be able to host my show so four times over the show that i planned to do which was local to me had to be cancelled and wow i found it very frustrating um you know 18 months time for a prep God, I had maybe two or three months within that time where I would slack off off the diet and just eat whatever. But the carnivore diet allowed me to get back on track so much quicker. I I basically um, I started off just reducing some foods, and it might be that I would not eat rice, heavy starches, but I might have some maybe some broccoli or carrots or peas or things like that. So I wouldn't cut out all carbohydrates and plant matter. And what happened was I did that over two to three weeks. Um, I suggest most people to do it for longer periods of time, but it depends on your own, where, where, your, where your start point is. Um, someone that's been eating a standard American diet for 50 years might take them longer to adapt. They might have accumulated more issues in relation to their diet over that time. So it will take longer um but from there yes yeah, so i i i found as time went on i had a more intuitive approach so i would be able to recognize what foods i needed and when and for a lot of people in the carnival community online they'll say you know just eat meat you know drink water and salt your food yeah that kind of does work but we all have our genetic differences so I think it would be unwise to just do that. That's more of a final elimination diet where people have tried everything else. Um, for example, myself, I have a high need to, to acquire omega-3, choline, and vitamin B2, which is root flavor in my diet. One of the few ways I'm going to do that um, at least the ways that I prefer to do it is for the cons consumption of eggs. They're very high in those nutrients. And that's how my diet is specific to me. So I have a lot more eggs in relation to a lot of other people that, you know, they might have. Um, so where I'm now is I'm able to effectively decipher what my body needs and when. And I am finding that in that time, it is ballparking between a certain level. Um, sometimes I might have more eggs or less eggs. I tend to get 
certain feelings in my body and my brain function significantly improves when I have more oily fish. I suffer with autistic spectrum disorder and I had delayed speech um, at younger years. So being articulate and being able to sort of compose myself socially is very difficult. But what I've noticed as time's gone on and the further towards zero carb, you know, completely emitting plants I get, I'm able to function uh, to so in a social capacity at a lot higher level. Yeah, that's incredible. And um, I think Sean mentioned it in his interview with you, but I'll, I'll say it again. You wouldn't guess it <laughs> just speaking with you and hearing you articulate yourself on, on, on your YouTube channel and things like that. I, I think you're very articulate. Um, so that's fantastic that you've been able to find um, something that helps there. This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore. Many people I talk to struggle to get enough organ meat on a carnivore diet. There's debate about whether you need to eat organs or not, but I like to supplement with organ meats and it makes me feel better and many carnivores would agree. Optimal Carnivore was created by carnivores for carnivores. In fact, I was consulted during the formulation, which is pretty cool. Um, they have a unique organ complex that combines nine different organs, liver, brain, heart, and more, um, all from grass-fed, grass-finished animals in New Zealand. And taking six capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw liver. Um, and it's it's completely freeze-dried, and they use a very high-quality process to retain all the nutrients. You can use the link in the episode description or um, the link in my Instagram bio and use the code carnivore 10 to save a checkout and support the show. Thank you. And how about like the process of becoming fat adapted? Um, what was that like for you? Um, I'm guessing you mean in regards to like training and strength. Yeah, exactly. Training. Yeah. Yeah. So I found a very small brief initial drop off in my training strength, strength endurance. It wasn't significant to the point where I thought, hmm, you know, I've got problems there. I'm going to lose all my muscle mass. The thing is your body will, will have to declog a lot of your system in order to become fat adapted. It will take people time. Um, the idea that you're going to do a three day fast from having a standard American diet, then being in a ketogenic state where you're fat adapted, it's not going to work out too well. Um, your body is still processing the glycogen, and the carbohydrate foods that were in your diet prior to that. So it will take time. Um, I'd say initially after maybe, maybe two weeks, I was back to normal where my training performance was initially. Um, I'm not saying that just as guesswork. I did notice it was on par or in some great cases increased. Um, the thing that people don't talk about with the carnival diet much is that you don't need as much food volume in order to, to achieve um, you, a satiety and signal leptin, you know, your hunger hormones, like you're, you've been fed, basically. And for me, someone that comes from a background of, if I'm honest, I'd say binge eating, um, I would have to eat so much food just to feel like I've hit the spot. And I'd crave and I'd, and I'd have this obsession with having these big bowls of rice and chicken and all this other stuff. And I put loads of sauce on it and lo loads of junk, basically. And I got so over the top. Um, what happens is, is when you're in a diet where you're consuming a large bonus of carbohydrates, is that your pancreas has to work to secrete insulin. And as this happens, you're, you essentially have an expiry date on the amount of insulin they can put out. So it, you can keep doing it because your body doesn't want to struggle to process the glycogen and force it into muscles and things like that and other tissues. But as time goes on, you become less sensitive to it. So your body has to secrete more insulin and then you start running into issues with your blood sugar. So people that are watching this might think, oh, I don't need to do this. I'm fine. I can do 2,000 grams of carbohydrates a day and I've been doing it for years. You have an expiry date and your body will pay you back for it eventually. Um, I'd, I'd rather it didn't, um, admittedly, but that's just the case. And as time has gone on for me, um, 
it's been very clear for myself, clients, and the millions of anecdotes that are online. It's it's very potently clear that a diet with enough fat and protein is perfectly adequate to support the human diet and nourish them to the, the point where they're able to function optimally. And do you think um in terms of like performance and bodybuilding that a carnivore diet, a well-constructed carnivore diet, taking into account like, you know, different individual nutritional needs, like you said, with regards to choline and, and um, things like that. Um, do you think that can, that can be um, adequate or optimal for bodybuilding? Um, like I, I know there's a lot of evidence that works very well for endurance sports, um, but something that's more glycolytic, like bodybuilding, do you think it can still work very well for that? Yeah, so there's a there's a thought that's going around in bodybuilding. And at the moment, it was espoused by someone called Milos Sarchev. He's a, he's a great guy. Like, I don't have a personal fault against him. Um, I don't know him, but, you know, from what I see online, he sounds all right. Um, but basically, he promotes a very high-carbohydrate diet. And many of his athletes are on something like, I say the larger ones at least, over a thousand grams of carbohydrates a day. And the idea of that is that they're able to use insulin or other performance enhancing drugs to be able to uptake that into their muscle cells so they get more volume. The problem I have with that is you need more and more insulin over time in order to store those carbohydrates that you're taking in. So you're basically chasing the dragon to a point where, where you're needing more and more of one drug to support your muscle ma- growth and muscle mass. And the thing is, the day you go on less carbohydrates, you become less responsive, you're more fatigued, and you suffer exponentially. Um, and the other idea is that you need glucose from carbohydrates to optimize protein synthesis. The problem with, I have with that idea is that we know without doubt now that leucine is the main signaler of protein synthesis in the muscles. Um, for people that are watching this, you, you'll find your amount that you need is very individual. So what I'm saying to people at the moment is to consume a diet with roughly 1.75 grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight. That aligns with um, what Bart K on the internet also says. Now, if you're someone that's maybe like myself, you train quite hard and you want to build your muscle. And when I say hard, I mean you're training to failure nearly every set. You know, you're not going to be training six times a week if you're doing this sort of training it's probably going to be about four or five and what i'm saying to those people at least is to consume between three and four grams per kilo of lean body mass so for someone weighing 100 kilograms that 10 percent body fat that might be i don't know 270 to 360 grams of protein per day there are there are problems that people might have with this and we can go into it if you like but basically some people won't be able to tolerate that. It takes a certain level of adaptation. So I'm not saying to people that are watching this video to go straight from 100 grams protein day to 300 or whatever it is. Um, it's not going to work out. Your gut motility will not let you. So you have to incrementally add to it as time goes on. And another issue people have is that they cannot, they cannot basically utilize the protein as well because they're not able to store it and what it is is they they have issues with their blood glucose where essentially it's always elevated because of having multiple meals per day that are also very high in protein and you need although you need to support muscle growth by in, including protein to develop and repair everything you do also need time to re- recover. So it's a fine balancing act. So you need the time when you're asleep to be completely rested. I say to people, give it at least two to three hours before bed. 
that you have your last meal. Your first meal, um, it depends how much and how often you're eating during the day. Some people can train fasted and be just fine. Myself personally, I like to have one meal in the morning. That seems to be very individual because I've met hundreds of people and that are following a sort of similar diet. And what they've been saying is I need uh, protein, fat, you know, eggs and cheese or something in the morning before I train. I prefer to train fasted. That's very individual. It might be, in, in my opinion, the idea that we lose a lot of minerals, electrolytes, and dehydrate more uh, and over the period of the night. Like myself, I sweat a lot. So in the morning, I need to almost top that up. Like a body will recycle nutrients and try to maintain homeostasis. But for me, it's easier just to top that level up so I can get in and go to the gym and have optimal training performance. So, yeah, I hope that gives you a good, good answer and idea of what I think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, an issue I see a lot, and I had personally with trying to consume really high amounts of calories and, and kind of body build on the carnivore diet is... Um, actually I, I tolerated the high amounts of protein very well. Um, I could eat, you know, three, 400, sometimes more grams of protein, um, without issue. And, um, after doing carnivore for very strictly for three years and before that a ketogenic diet, um, I think my body was able to assimilate that protein very well and, um, convert it to glucose, um, when I needed it to. Um, so my resting blood glucose was still at a healthy level, um, but I was able to, um, you know, get through these, these glycolytically demanding, you know, hour, hour and a half more, um, training sessions, um, and still perform very well. Um, so I think that was a sign that, you know, my body was basically using the protein as like a slow releasing, um, glucose source, um, which, which is really good. Um, the problem I had was digesting enough fat. Um, so even with, you know, 300 grams of protein a day, um, to meet my calorie needs, which were to maintain my body weight about 4,000 calories, um, that's a lot of fat. And even with trying different fat sources, you know, um, trying raw beef suet, more solid fats, um, trying different ratios, trying different meal timings. Eventually my, my, and even with digestive enzymes, I had a lot of issues tolerating on a consistent basis, more than like 150 grams of fat a day. Um, so I guess what have you found to work well with regards to, um, you know, when you are, you know, someone your size eating a lot of eating a lot of protein, but also needing to fill your calorie, um, your calorie allotment with, adequate fat how have you found that to work sure scott so before i get brutally criticized by someone that watches my videos in this video um calories are a measurement of heat um they don't they don't equate to the effective energy of a given food um i understand for people um calories are a measurement that people can identify with so I'll, I can give ideas of what calories um, I'm ingesting from the food. Um, I just have to mention that because someone will watch this video and say, yeah, yeah. You have a really, I'll also point people to, you have an excellent video on your YouTube channel about calories um, and calories in calories out. And I, I think you describe it really well there. Um, and yeah, I, I use calories because it's, it's a measure we have. It's, it's not the best measure, um, but it is a measure and it's, you know, just a reflection of, of the composition of macronutrients you're consuming. Um, but totally agreed that it's not as simple as calories in calories out. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you asked me about adaptation and consuming more fat or protein. So in regards to fat intake, like yourself i also struggle to consume enough um i'm someone with quite a, a high metabolic rate although it is very adaptable so i can sustain myself on lower engine intakes and also higher in engine intakes my out my my non-effective activity expen expenditure so um they call it neat 
So my, my energy expenditure when I'm at rest is higher when I'm consuming more calories. Um, it's lower when I'm consuming less calories. So my body does adapt to try and keep my body fat at a certain set point. Um, you mentioned about you having issues with your fat intake, and it could be that you're, you, you said um, digestive enzymes taking maybe bile salts, things like that. What I'm saying to a lot of people is that these things can take time. And it might be that you will never be able to take in 250, 300 grams of fat. I don't know. I, I can only speculate. Um, but what it is, is people have a lot of damage to their gut wall. And they're un unable to assimilate and get the fats into their system to provide energy. Um, so what it is, is people like Scott and myself initially had essentially the runs. Um, you can see so much fat and it just goes through. Your body doesn't deal very well. And that's usually a lack of bile acid. The things that can negatively impact your gut wall are medications, antibiotics, over-the-counter painkillers, um, some spices, you know, toxic foods, things we're allergic to. A lot of things can damage it. Um, dairy for some people, eggs. You know, there's a lot in our environment, food, even the water that can damage our gut wall. So what I say to a lot of people that are struggling to adapt to a higher fat intake is to scale back the foods that you are eating. So if you're adding spice to your diet, reduce that a bit. Just give it time and let your body heal, heal the damage that has accrued over time. And it may take years, honestly. Um, I meet and I've spoken to a lot of people that said, you know, I've been following a carnivore diet or a keto diet or whatever for a long period of time. And when I ask them about their medical history, oftentimes, I say more often than not, they they had antibiotics in the last year. Um, they've destroyed their gut microbiome. They've now got to spend all that time building it back up. And the problem I have with probiotic supplements is, not always, but oftentimes, a lot of the studies are done in a Petri dish. They don't hold much value as to what happens in the human dynamic system. So I'm someone that used to work in a health food shop, I'm one of the best in my country, and I would sell tons of probiotics. I mean, I'd say it's probably one of the top three to five supplements that I'd sell on a given day. The thing is with a lot of those products, even the well-researched good ones, um, quote unquote, were that people would not come back to buy them. We would get very few return customers. And what I'm saying to a lot of people is if they can tolerate it, as in their body has no negative reactions to it, is to include some fermented foods. So this might be kefir or kefir, some people call it as well, um, kombucha and sauerkraut, kimchi, things like that. These have trillions of live bacteria and in good formats that your body will benefit from. Another point I want to make is that the idea that a diverse diet is what provides a perfect gut microbiome, healthy gut microbiome. I, I cannot get my head around that and I can't agree with it. The reason being in over 350,000 years of human evolution, we have subsisted predominantly on meat and animal fat. In that time, we've consumed very little plant matter and also no probiotics, funny enough. But as time went on, we did learn ways to preserve our food, so we'd ferment it, pickle it in a jar, and that would give us bacteria which would benefit our guts. And you've got to think, all those years, you know, hundreds of thousands of years we've been eating predominantly meat, only the last maybe 8, 10, 12,000 years we've been eating other foods at least the quantities that we have. And what we've seen in that time is that our brain capacity has shrunk by around 200 cubic centiliters. And our, our health state has worsened. People say our longevity is much more, much greater. But we're living longer, but in a more unhealthy state. So we're not living better. And that's, in my opinion, and directly linked to the grain, flour, corn, fruit consumption. Um, a lot of foods that we eat nowadays are 
they're inorganic they're not created in a way that is ancestrally compatible they aren't they're modern foods they're like the they're essentially a step back from processed foods and if you step it back a step further you'll find you know animal foods protein um animal fat is what we would eat so yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense and um you mentioned uh you know having previous issues um especially when you're younger with with almost binge eating do you find that um eating a carnivore diet has helped your relationship with food or um the way you look at foods as well yeah for sure scott so when i used to go to the supermarket after my body weight conditions i would scale down the aisles and look that looks good that looks good that looks good all these foods that you emitted from a diet for so long seems so appealing and the problem there was i'd buy them and i'd eat them <laughs> nearly all of them i'd come i come back from the, the shop with um probably 40 pounds worth or 45 50 dollars worth of snacks and sweets junk food chocolate whatever what it was is that my body wasn't craving these foods it was craving real nutrient density real biologically compatible with the human system food so the animal proteins again i keep at rational point animal proteins animal fats um so what i've come to terms with over time is that our body has signals that are linked to our gut and even our mouth we we identify if a food is good for us or bad for us um the problem with sugar intake is that it throws those hunger cues off and those signals will not be appropriate or definitely not sustainable not to create a healthy human being so as, as time has gone on i've decreased the volume of my food so i no longer need and have that desire to feel stuffed but if you look at my meals on instagram or wherever i post them what, what i eat in the day video you'll see it's all nutrient dense food if you were to, to tally it all up and look at a nutrient chart i hit every single thing religiously and it's always like that and when when you when you acquire a lot more nutrient dense in your diet it's a lot easier to abstain from these foods i'm someone that has to abstain from everything essentially um what i will do however which i tell people as a disclaimer is that every now and then maybe once a month or so i will plan a meal out with family or loved ones friends and that meal will be what I want to eat. And that will be anything. The thing is, I try to keep that meal at the end of the day. So I'm less likely to carry on for the rest of the day eating um, incompatible foods. And what I have is I'll try to select a food that is rich in animal fat and protein. Then I have a, a low toxicity plant food with it. So it might be that I have um, fruit. Uh, onions aren't too bad white potato cucumber you know stuff like that so things where i've taken the peel off i've reduced the fiber intake and the oxalate anti-nutrient content of the food I've then boiled it and cooked, it's been cooked in the appropriate way then i've had it that doesn't seem to cause you too much of an issue um i do however notice for about 24 to 48 hours after i consume that meal i have some gastric distress my body ultimately if i'm consuming one meal out of 140 plus 140 ish meals per month that doesn't match what i was eating for the 139 meals it's not gonna it's not gonna work out too well my body's not used to it in that regard so i think you've got to sort of create a healthy habit with food and find out if you have something you just love to eat like maybe it'll be cereal or um, potato chips crisps whatever it is maybe just say to yourself if you're trying to start the diet have it once every now and then you know as a treat um you're not going to suffer as much if, as if you put it at the end of your meal uh, end of your day and just get nutrient dense foods in that's what i think it comes down to yeah i think that's very well said and um things get simpler when you focus on um the right types of food um and Jonathan, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your spine and um, what you've suffered from there. 
Um, can you can you tell folks a little bit about your history with with your back? Yeah, sure. So since the age of around 13, 14 years old, I have been suffering with back problems. Um, over years, have it's proliferated to a much greater degree. Um, what it is is I had a direct collision. Um, I was illegally tackled in an illegal rugby match held in Italy on an international school sports tour. And we're playing against adults. And long story short, two pedicles at the bottom of my spine cracked. And uh, imagine they're just floating around back there now some, somewhere, I don't know. Um, and what then happened was my vertebrae at the bottom, so my L5 vertebrae would shift forward. So what that's causing on my spinal cord is a pinching, um, a bit like sciatica. Uh, based on what I'm hearing from people when they've experienced sciatica, um, compared to my symptoms, mine are much worse. I, I had a scan roughly a year or two ago, and that was a result of me constantly pressuring my GP and orthopedic team to look at it, see what's wrong there, because I'm a 27-year-old man. I shouldn't be suffering with these problems. I train safely, effectively, and my movements are contr controlled in the gym. So it doesn't make sense that I, I would have a few days off the gym and I'd have this much pain. Like it doesn't seem to correlate or work out too well for me. Um, getting back to the point, so my my diagnosis has basically led me to have a spinal surgery, which will be upcoming, um, roughly two to three months from now, I imagine. And what they're going to do is they're going to make two cuts on my lower back. Um, I believe the procedure is called a Wilkes approach, and they're going to move the lumbar spine muscles apart. And they're going to basically bolt together the L5 and S1 vertebrae. And that'll be pinched together with the bit in the middle removed. Um, funny enough, I'll actually probably be about an inch taller, apparently. So that helps. Wow. Like, you know, <laughs> six foot one. Yeah, so six foot one now, so I could be six foot two in a few months' time. Who knows? Um, luckily, I still meet it under the weight caps to some bodybuilding shows. So that's quite handy. Um, so yeah, I've I've managed to decrease some of my medications and narrowed it down to some things that I have to take now. Um, people say, you know, you don't need them, just reduce inflammation. Um, I'll address this in this video because maybe people will try and remember it when they ask me in the future. Um, my inflammatory markers are around zero. Um, I can't, my diet cannot be any more specific to my health condition. Um, there is no lack of or additional training that I could do in my training plan that would alleviate my symptoms. Um, I am I wouldn't take this lightly to have a the second most um major surgery that someone could have, you know, in, in all my spine, unless I had to take it. So yeah, so that's where I stand about it now and where I train, my diet is all tailored around mitigating any further damage and just alleviating the pain in general. Yeah, that sounds incredibly difficult. And I'm sorry you have to suffer through that. I've had uh, my share of struggles with back injuries, nothing as serious as as, as um, your disease, but um, I've had very bad back pain. Um, just three months ago, actually, <laughs> for my 30th birthday, I had a major muscle spasm in my back and I couldn't walk for about a week. Um, so yeah, it, it can be so debilitating. Um, but uh, I'm glad that um, you're getting the right medical help you need. Um, and, and I fully agree with what you're saying. Like at some point um, you can do everything possible to help alleviate and mitigate through, through diet and lifestyle. Um, but ultimately in a lot of these cases, you know, some medical intervention is very necessary. Um, so I think that's a great point. Mm. Yeah. I, I feel bad for you. Cause I, I mean, the problem with pain is it's very hard to measure. And my pain is different to yours. It's different to the next person's. Um, people people say things like, well, you know, you shouldn't go to the gym. You should do this. My capacity for training is so limited. I used to squat 245 kilograms. That's something like just over 500 pounds for six to eight repetitions. 
pasta grass. Wow. Um, now, putting 100 kilos on my back, so 220 pounds, is quite quite impossible. So my training is adapted to suit my body. Um, my advice to anyone that has any issues with the back is to get it thoroughly checked and by a good team of people if it's possible. Um, only 80% roughly of x-ray scans that people have um, are given a correct diagnosis by the regular radiographer. In my case, I was fortunate they got it right the first time, but, but if something is wrong with your spine and you're letting it persist, please just get in touch with a healthcare provider and make the appropriate court calls and hassle them because you shouldn't have to suffer. And I would hate that someone else to be in my position personally. Um, so I feel for you, Scott, there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's obviously very individual. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing in like the lifting and fitness and bodybuilding world, how much misinformation and lack of information there is about, um, spinal health, given how prevalent and, um, and debilitating, uh, any type of back injury can be, um, you know, you, you see top athletes and bodybuilders, like deadlifting with a rounded spine and them saying like, Oh, it's fine. It like makes your back stronger. There's other people who say like, you should never do any type of axial loading at all. Um, and it's just like, and, and then, you know, if you go to gyms, like the, the types of machines or exercises that would actually strengthen your back in a safe and healthy way are extremely rare. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like the wild west, um, which is, which is definitely strange. Um, well, this has been fantastic, Jonathan. Um, can you talk about maybe what are some of the goals with, um, you know, your website and your brand composition consultant, um, and what types of people you, you help? So I've been able to successfully position myself as somewhat of an expert in one the composition. Um, I don't like to post a lot of pictures of clients and this, that, and the other, because I respect people's privacy and some people just might not want it. Um, I am, I am someone that can help someone to reduce their body fat by a tremendous amount in quite a short period of time. The thing is what I'm doing in that time, as well as I'm increasing the muscle mass and giving them appropriate programming as a specific to them. And back on the, the, the expert side of it. Um, so I'm a forum moderator in a number of different places on Facebook. I offer a lot of free advice. And I, used, I came from a background in palliative care. We used to volunteer at a ward for four years. And I got very fed up of seeing sick and ill people. Um, so I'm looking at myself thinking, I'm taking these steps to improve my health, my, my spine, autism, whatever it might be, chronic fatigue even. And people out there are suffering as well. And that that doesn't sit too well with me. So the thing about my brand is I want people to be able to come to me, receive affordable, specific, tailored advice that they can work with to create positive health outcomes. My, my slogan is aligning physique goals with positive health outcomes. And that's something that I'm trying to really reinforce you don't have to be a bodybuilder like myself um you don't have to be somewhere in the middle or anything else you can just be someone that works to and aspires to be stronger fitter just healthier in general and health and diet and training can co-align you can put these things together and create a matrix to really promote good health Yeah, I think th that resonates with me and it resonates with a lot of people. Um, a lot of people are past the point of just wanting to, you know, look better or, um, you know, at the expense of their health. Um, so being able to do both those things at once um, and obviously your, your tremendous knowledge and experience can help people do that. I think that's really excellent. Um, well, Jonathan, thank you so much for the time today. This has been great. It's great getting to know you a bit better. Um, and thank you for, for sharing so much. Um, I'll, I'll have links to your website and YouTube channel and Instagram in the show notes. Um, is there anywhere else that, uh, people should, should try to find you? 
So I'm on Facebook under the name Jonathan Griffiths. That's my full name. Um, so yeah, other than that, it's just Instagram, Facebook. I have a LinkedIn account, but I don't really actively use that. But if you need to send a message and that's the only platform you have, then feel free to do so. Awesome. Great. Well, um, have a fantastic rest of your day. And, and thanks again, Jonathan. And you, Scott. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered? Or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.